The Lord be with you. I'm Pastor Dwayne Bomsch, pleased to serve you as president of Higher Things. This past summer, we learned about being forgiven at our four conferences. We talked about how forgiveness is won for you and how it is delivered to you. These are two distinct and separate things. The fact of your being forgiven and the application of Jesus' forgiveness to you. It's pretty easy to say that Jesus died for the sins of the world, isn't it? It's something else entirely to say that Jesus died for you. To actually say, Jesus died for me. It can be incredibly difficult to comprehend the vastness of God the Father's mercy for you in Christ. I mean, who am I after all? That almighty God, he who spoke creation into existence, the one who tracks the grains of sand on the seashore and the number of the stars in the sky and the sparrows on the wing, who am I that he should pay attention to me? I mean, if you're a faithful churchgoer, you hear about the gospel all the time. At least I hope you do. But do you actually hear the gospel? Do you hear what the Son of God has done in a way that you comprehend what has happened on a cosmic scale for you? Have you truly grasped what Jesus has done to fix what has gone so terribly wrong and so utterly broken about our universe, our world, our relationships, you know, even our bodies. I mean, he does know the number of hairs on your head after all. Or is it just easier to abstract all of that out and only see our Lord's work in theoretical ways. I mean, you know John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And what about 1 Timothy 2? God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth and there are so many more of your favorite Bible passages that speak immutable truths like this. But you aren't really sure if they apply to you. You've heard them so many times that they lose the punch that they once had. I mean, they might work for somebody else. But for me, no, I'm not so sure that God has me in mind with those words from Holy Scripture. I mean, after all, if they really meant something, if they meant something for me, I'd feel it, right? I'd have a sense of, of awe, a sense of wonder. Not the skies opening and the angel choruses singing through the rays of sunlight, mind you but I definitely have a sense of wonder, a sense of joy if those words were really for me. Remember your confirmation verse? Or do you need to look it up? I mean, the, the trials of this life really do push the holy things aside so readily. And that's a really big challenge in this increasingly isolated world of ours, isn't it? The last 18 plus months, they've wreaked havoc on our sense of community, on our idea of the body of Christ, as a, as a unified, as a together, as an inseparable gathering. And because of all that separation, you wonder, if God the Father has forgotten you, if he remembers who you are, if you, what you hear on a Sunday really applies to you. 
How do you know that you are forgiven? How do you know that this Jesus, this forgiveness, these sublime gifts of God are for you? What can break through all of the noise and assure you that Jesus, that God made man, that the Son of God made flesh for you and for your salvation is truly for you? That he truly loves you, that he has made a place for you. This is the church that I serve. Grace Lutheran Church, Grass Valley, California, up in the Sierra Nevada foothills, up the hill from Sacramento, Donner Pass, Lake Tahoe over that way. Every Sunday, I stand right here. Well, I stand right over there. And I speak the invocation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to my gathered people. And so this is not just the place where the divine service begins, but where the gathered saints of God remember that they're baptized, where they hear each and every week that this is where God has placed his name upon them. This is where he has washed them, where he has made them new. And so every Sunday morning, as the hymn of invocation comes to a close, I dip my fingers in these waters and I remind myself that Jesus has washed me, a poor, miserable sinner, that he has placed his name upon me, that he has made me his own. And that's the thing. These waters, they're not just these waters. By the power of the living word of God, these waters are tied in an inexplicable and a sacramental way to the River Jordan. Time and reality get all jumbled up in these waters. For it is in these waters that the sinner is washed of his sin. And those Sins, that sin floats back through time in the waters of ancient Judea. And Christ Jesus steps into the river Jordan for his own baptism. And like a sponge, he soaks up all of those sins into himself to bear them, to carry them all the way to Golgotha. One of my favorite bits from the book of Romans is from chapter 6. St. Paul asks his hearers, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So you see, these waters, it's no mere symbol. There's no empty rite, no nice event to invite Aunt Mabel to come see. No, this is is reality itself being changed. This is death and the world and Satan being defeated and destroyed. This is your sinful flesh being changed. Now, you saw this graphic, if you were with us in Colorado, based on those very words of St. Paul. For in these waters, you are not only washed of your sin, you are, as the blue line shows, crucified with Jesus. You're buried with him in his tomb. You're raised to life everlasting. It's a gift that you possess right now, this very moment. But that red line, it's a gift that you have right now. 
but you will only fully enjoy it on the last day when Christ comes again in glory and you live again. Everlasting life is yours now, though. And the brief splash of these very waters reminds you that your very specific sins have been forgiven by a very specific Savior for the very specific you. You who feels those waters on your flesh. One day... I know it's bad news. One day you will die. You will be laid to rest. But on the last day, you will rise to life everlasting by the power of the word of the Lord, by the power of the shout of the risen Jesus come again. So in these waters, you're remade. God's own child, you gladly say it. You are baptized into Christ. But wait, with the word of the Lord, there's always more. I mean, that was just the invocation. (laughs) Confession and absolution is spoken here too. Right here where so many were baptized, the words that absolve sin ring out once more in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ and consciences are soothed. But sometimes your sin doesn't feel forgiven, though, does it? And that's why we reminded you this past summer about private confession and absolution, where God himself hears your confession, separates your sin from you as far as east is from west, and speaks through your pastor the promise of absolution yet again. It's a wonderful gift the Lord gives to be able to confess a sin directly to him and to hear immediately in your ears the absolution, the forgiveness of that sin. So never forget that your Lord and your God wants to hear from you even when you're ashamed to face him. I mean, you may well want to run and hide like Adam and Eve in the garden when they heard the Lord walking in the cool of the day. But your Lord is patient. He'll wait to hear from you. He is not ashamed of you. As much as you might think that he will turn aside at your failures, no, that's why he sent Jesus, after all, to cover those sins. The divine service doesn't stop here, though. At the lectern, over there, the Holy Scriptures are read. The living and active Word of God comes again to those gathered. The Word that spoke creation into existence crashes into eardrums and echoes into brains and hearts that desperately need to hear of the Lord's mercy. Then, of course, the sermon continues from the pulpit. Can't have a divine service without a sermon, can you? where the under-shepherd appointed by God expounds on that word, the Lord, the gospel. And so the pastor tries to make some sense of the deeply profound truth of Jesus' words, words that carry life and forgiveness and salvation into your ears. He doesn't always hit it out of the park, though, does he? Some sermons are duds. No, it's true. And any pastor that doesn't realize that some of his preachments miss the mark isn't paying attention. But that's the beauty of the liturgy. The rest of the divine service redeems even the sinful preacher. But the pinnacle, the pinnacle that happens right here at this altar Upon that altar, upon that mercy seat, upon that throne, the risen and living Jesus, God made flesh, breaks open the very fabric of reality to be sacramentally and truly present for you in bread and wine that is his body and blood. 
It's very real and a very specific thing that happens. The same Jesus who soaked up your sin in the Jordan is the same Jesus who blood soaks into the wood of the cross and the dirt of Golgotha outside Jerusalem. But that blood isn't just wasted on wood and ground. It flowed from holy flesh to wash over the altar of sacrifice. The wood of Christ's cross to which he was nailed was like the wood upon the altar where Isaac was bound by Abraham until a ram nearby took his place. That sacrificial blood poured out upon the altar of that cross to quell the voice of wrath, to quench the fire of vengeance, to slake the thirst of the sinner desperate for forgiveness. Jesus' blood poured from his wounds to fill a cup that runs over eternally, to fill a cup that sits upon the altar here, yet is mirrored in eternity as well. Mirrored in eternity as well-aged wine that the saints receive as a gift at the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's Psalm 23. It's another one of those passages that we know so well that it falls into the cracks of our minds. But true it is, this is the table prepared for you. That is where the cup that runneth over sits. That is the place where Jesus takes his forgiveness and he places it on your tongue. He pours it into your mouth. That's where the flaming seraphim eternally trumpet in song, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, as the cup of the Lord is eternally filled and eternally remains full to overflowing. Because that is the love that your Lord and your God has for you. Never ending, never emptying, never waning, never wanting, always ready, always abundant, always for you. And that's where we'll pick up next summer. In Scranton and Bozeman and Valparaiso. Our theme reflects an expansion on and the natural extension of this year's forgiven. You'll hear what Jesus has done for you you'll be reassured that these really and truly are God's gifts for you. You'll hear again how these glorious and eternal gifts come to you through the power of your Lord and God's working within his church through the hands, through the voices of his servants. May the Lord our God bless and keep you now and always. And I can't wait to see y'all at For You.